Right, uh, there we go. Uh, it's all based on the original article. Updates, uh, haven't been doing them on the website. I've just been relying on the YouTube version and the uh, uh, slides which we sent to Simon still. So uh, if anybody wants uh, more detail from the links or the slides, email me on chair, RDRF, that's two hours in the middle at AOL.com. Okay, so first the good news is Annie Hidalgo got back in as uh, Mayor of Paris, quite obviously, uh, and uh, she was well known as uh, having this very clear plan for Paris involving taking out 70% of the car parking and um, uh, uh, also the Greens did uh, well throughout France. So that's some good news. Uh, I also thought I'd uh, put in some tweets from uh, Detective Superintendent Andy Cox, who many of you will know from Twitter. He is uh, the deputy head of uh, Metropolitan Police Roads and Traffic Command. Uh, I think I've got the right name there. And he is getting a reputation on social media for being one of the good guys. And here he's actually making a very... Uh, firm commitment towards um, uh, enforcement through dash cam and head cam uh, and also publishing uh, the results uh, which we've been trying to get the RDRF has been trying to support since uh, policing close passing of cyclists was introduced uh, in West Midlands uh, three years ago. Um, so uh, that's important. It's something to be chased up on. Uh, I haven't done an update recently because uh, police are not necessarily, are not required to report back to me and they're understandably busy with other stuff at the moment. Um, and uh, this is actually a, a sort of formal invitation and uh, um, I sit on the Vision Zero Action Group at uh, TFL and in the conference call on Thursday I'm going to be to, uh, asking him about uh, forms of publicizing this apart from social media. Okay a couple of bits of good news. Um, also the Committee on Climate Change which is a formal officially recognized group had in its key findings of its report uh, uh, of its advice to the UK Prime Minister had five clear investment priorities of which one is infrastructure to make it easy for people to walk, cycle and work remotely. Um, uh, it, it's also actually preparing us for a four degree uh, Celsius increase in temperature, which will be pretty disastrous. Uh, uh, people like Professor Kevin Anderson regard uh, their approach as, as not anything like strong enough, but uh, this is an official body saying that. And uh, Lord Deben, uh, who's uh, its chair, said uh, it makes sense to raise fuel prices. We should increase the tax on the very low oil prices we have at the moment. So there's some sort of good news. And the bad news is the Prime Minister's uh, announcements today, which didn't push green investment, and we're still talking about road building, uh, although not uh, explicitly endorsing the full 27 billion, as I understand it. Uh, uh, this is a graphic done by European Cyclist Federation. It's a bit crude, but it says uh, the UK has allocated the biggest budget uh, for COVID uh, infrastructure. But if you measure things in terms of kilometers of cycle lane, uh, amounts of traffic calming, etc. Uh, we're well behind France, Italy, Spain, and a few others like Belgium and Portugal. So that's not good news. Um, okay, so the general news is, is we're really in many ways much like where we were last week. A lot of delays, you know, we're now 101 days into the big, since the beginning of lockdown, and a lot of stuff should have been happening. But uh, the success of the tranche one bids, um, highway authorities in England were only informed last Friday 
and uh, any kind of official uh, listing from the DFT hasn't come out, as far as I know, for, since uh, early this afternoon. Um, uh, invitations for tranche two should have gone out the week before last. Uh, we were told by Roger Geffen that they were going to be out then, probably requiring more public en engagement. Uh, there has been indirect mention, uh, I'll give the exact quote a bit later, of the need for ambition uh, in tranche two. Um, uh, the updated National Cycling Walking Plan was due for June, that seems to have been pushed back. Uh, and uh, the Inspectorate, again, we haven't heard anything about that, or at least I haven't. Um, this is a quote from Grant Shapps uh, about access to bikeability, and he said he'd like to extend this to all adults who might not have been for a while, and he's actively looking at this to achieve it. Uh, that's three months after lockdown. Here's a quote from him, uh, what makes people cycle, it's easy to grab the bike, the space to cycle, the, the trick is to keep this going and not just make it a remember the lockdown, remember when everyone cycles. That requires more than just the extraordinarily large sums of money, which he says uh, it, they aren't extraordinarily large in terms of infrastructure and transport spending that we're putting into cycling. It also requires a change in culture. That's my emphasis. Um, uh, okay, here's the thing on the voucher scheme. The Department for Transport finally is now inviting bicycle repairers to sign up to its Fix Your Bike scheme, which will see people in England entitled to claim 50 pound vouchers. Some will be going out by the end of the month, but then they will only be released slowly because uh, the cycle trade is uh, uh, starved of uh, equipment and people to work on bikes. Um, so uh, that's only going to be coming out slowly. Um, it's a little tweet there from Tom Edwards, BBC, talking about uh, temporary traffic orders and why uh, consultation doesn't have to happen for 18 months. Um, Ruth Maokas has been raising the issue of safety for cycling during cycle lane building. And oh, there's your quote. We have to convey from ministers that they would like to see proposals of an even higher level of ambition for tranche two. That's uh, a quote from an unnamed Department for Transport official. Excuse me. So, Right. Uh, what we do know about tranche one is that scores out of 20 uh, have been um, given and it's to be published shortly. I just heard uh, about 20 minutes ago, sorry, I've, I've got only 50%. And uh, this is a tweet from Cycle Redhill and Rygate. They're matching it to deliver the original plans. However, I'm not sure that saying we're spending your council tax on schemes objectively judged as poor is as much of a good spin as they might think. Uh, Kent got 100% of its, uh, these, the only ones I've heard of are 100%, apart from Brighton and Hove, who got 112%. Um, Kent, uh, uh, Gary Utrun's done a, um, a, a uh, sort of detailed going through and it does seem to be a bit mixed quality despite the fact they get 100%. He talks about a stretch of road uh, just outside Hythe which I think I know and it's a, a sort of limited shared use path which isn't really very dramatically good. And West Sussex got 100% but some of that is 400 metres of cones to nowhere in Horsham so that's it. But uh, we haven't had all the official scores yet. Um, here's some stuff on the ground. It's actually gone in outside London. There's Leicester. They put up a nice notice there. There's some stuff from them. It was a good article by oh, nothing in Surrey or Merthyr uh, that we know of. Uh, there's, there's Leicester. And that you can go on to that link because they actually update things on that link. Uh, 
Um, a good article by Laura Laker on uh, what's been happening in West Midlands. So I do suggest you look at that. And they've also approved their uh, May emergency plan, or rather Birmingham Council has. Uh, there's Hinkley Road in Leicester. That's a sort of nice uh, taking a, a genuine reallocation of road space. Um, now I've got some photographs from Tim Phoebe of York. Uh, top is Bishop Thorpe Road. Um, the second, uh, the, uh, the photo on the bottom is interesting because that's a car park which has had 70 car parking spaces taken out for cycle space so cyclists can avoid the narrow path on the left. That's very interesting. That's the first time I've seen uh, parking spaces uh, in a car park taken out. Uh, oh, this is a nice little dinky one, Copper Gate in the uh, centre of York. Um, bit of footway extension on your right and a nice little contraflow uh, cycle lane with uh, with what uh, cylinders I should say um, on the left so it's a nice little bit of I thought we were going to see loads and loads of this going all over everywhere um, that's Castle Mills Bridge a lane is uh, the dual carriageway section of the inner ring road has been taken out and reallocated to cyclists only and Edinburgh, oh dear, uh, this was put up and someone was saying, you know, who could do that? You, you've got uh, specially allocated with cylinders and you plonk the signage right in the cycleway. Um, they could go further up by the signals, I think. Uh, although, you know, I'm not saying there are no potential problems, but uh, they need to be dealt with. Uh, now, backlash. Okay, so a few places where we've been seeing backlash, apparently in Exeter, according to Casper Hughes. Hackney, some uh, notices have been put on uh, car windscreens complaining about lack of consultation. Um, in Shrewsbury Town Centre, traffic closure hours have been scaled back. Uh, Southampton, the Tory MP is opposing uh, what uh, the Conservative government has been asking for. Uh, Kensington and Chelsea have withdrawn a proposed low traffic neighbourhood. Uh, Kingston, I mentioned this last week, I haven't heard any more about a temporary bike lane being taken out. Uh, Medway, extension of Rochester High Street, closure hours lasted one whole week. But actually some of these things are not really important. The couple of hours here or there are not going to make much difference to uh, not facilitating cycling and walking. Now this last quote is from John Irwin about Wandsworth. Uh, and he's saying that consultation using a trial based on public health guidance during a pandemic is pulled because of people's fears that although well-founded experience shows elsewhere that the feared impacts don't materialize, uh, they're pulling it. And he suggests that uh, Wandsworth count, uh, officers were instructed to engage uh, by elected members um, to actually block this. Uh, so do read the tweets and the thread from uh, uh, Claire Fraser, the, the uh, um, council leader, um, and uh, John Owen talks about how uh, uh, Lib Dem councillor in neighbouring Richmond is able to empower officers to engage in a different way. Anyway, just mentioning some stuff has been taken out. Right, now, problems with filters, uh, filtered permeability. Uh, so there's been some talking about this, they take a while to get used to. Will drivers plan and rejig their routes accordingly? Uh, and will politicians hold their ground armed with the facts? Uh, will camera only enforcement be operated effectively so that there is actual uh, notification of intent to uh, a notification sent out by the council? Because if you don't, you get what uh, Tom Holland of the BBC has been tweet is uh, been putting out on Twitter. Um, here's a screenshot of uh, modal filters on Upwood Road in Lewisham, and you can actually see 
uh, in the video, uh, you see this car's just gone through. There's a string of cars just mounting the, the pavement, going through vans and so on. Um, uh, but I'm pleased to say that uh, um, Detective Superintendent Cox has asked for details, and so hopefully uh, prosecutions will be resulting. Um, Greater Manchester, yes, today was the formal opening of this, the Cyclopes Junction at Royce Road in Hume, the first specialist cycling junction of its kind in the UK. Uh, there's a video of uh, someone using it yesterday on Chris Boardman's feed and uh, the release from Transport for Greater Manchester is in that second link. Now, I know Brian doesn't want things to be criticism free. So here's a quote from David Hembro, uh, where he says, that is astonishingly complex. I mean, you knew he wasn't going to agree with it unless it was an identical replica of everything in, in the Netherlands. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, the, there have been, if you look at the tweets, there have been various, um, uh, complaints and arguments and it won't work and whatever and when do you use this and so on but uh, I think that needs to be built, dealt with uh, on, as a special case just by itself. Okay now to London uh, where Street Space for, for uh, London uh, was launched on the 15th of May. We're now in the last week of June We've had three months since lockdown, and again, the theme of what I'm saying today is delay, delay, delay. Uh, do look at that article again. I'm, I'm putting it up that now, I think, for the second week running uh, from the LCC website, and also what has been going wrong, and those are mandatory reading. Uh, TFL schemes, Euston Road, uh, the order has been seen on, on lampposts uh, uh, for Euston Road uh, from the 25th. Um, it actually starts, goes into operation today. And uh, it's a short stretch of Euston Road. It was uh, referred to on the 15th of May. This is happening now. Uh, so, um, Hampstead Road, also TFL scheme in Camden. Um, some of it is protected, some of it isn't protected. Um, Camden cyclists and Linus Reese have been tweeting. Um, and I still don't know about the top and bottom of the park lane uh, bi directional cycle lanes. Um, Regent's Park, again, nothing new, nothing is likely to happen, and it isn't under TFL's aegis, but they could do something about it, I think, if they really wanted to. Uh, general TFL policy uh, being a uh, uh, formal report and complaint about Silvertown Tunnel. Phil Goodwin, who I'll refer to later, has been saying, why build this now? Um, and uh, nothing about smart road user charging. And uh, I think we've still got some design problems with uh, the pop-up cycle lanes at junctions. Um, okay, here's uh, a letter from uh, the, I think it's the leader of London Borough of Havering, uh, vying to be the worst borough in London for cycling along with Barnet. Um, uh, and here's a letter, this has actually been sort of officially replicated in the committee report saying seeking funding from TfL for measures, these include school street schemes, stenciling, wow, stenciling, signage on the public highway to maintain social distancing, some temporary physical measures, bollards and codes to extend the footpaths, I think he means footway, um, no mention of filters, filtered permeability, low traffic neighbourhoods, 20 miles per hour, or cycle lanes. That's LB Havering, you know, completely against the government instructions. Um, now, uh, this is a uh, hat tip to Laura Laker, 
uh, the fourth of six allocations made under TfL's street space program has been made uh, as two and a half, two and a half million pounds. Uh, Sutton comes in with a fairly, you know, that looks like a fairly comprehensive program. Uh, Hackney's getting half a million. So far, they've had two million pounds. Um, they have 120 modal filters in Hackney. There was only one formal low traffic neighborhood and now under the wonderful councillor John Burke, they've now voted for another two. Um, now, here's uh, something about school streets. Now, I think I'm sure that they're, they're very good. They're a lot better than what we spent several years trying to achieve with school travel plans. But I, there's money going for school streets in these dreadful boroughs, uh, Kensington, Chelsea, Barnet and Bexley, Greenwich haven't been doing too well. Now my suggestions is that they are a, not area, they are a default for boroughs that don't want to reallocate road space, uh, which is what the government wants them to do. I think they are being bid for as a kind of easy option and we don't really want to reallocate road space. Um, quote from Simon of LCC uh, says there's an ongoing process of trying to get the quality up. That's one of the links I referred to before. With boroughs having had bids sent back to improve the quality of what they're proposing. And he says the next two and a half weeks funding allocations may change the picture significantly. One must hope so. So I've got a, you've got another three weeks potentially of me saying oh, nothing's really happening as well as it should be in, in London. Uh, there's 20 million pounds more to come. That's from uh, the extra DFT money to TfL, as I understand it. Um, each borough gets 100K. Uh, Lambeth have already got 100K to add on from the DFT to add on um, to, to make a, uh, I think it's a network of, of, of cycle routes or a cycle route. Um, uh, six of the boroughs in London, apparently, I don't know which ones, have only got 50% of the 100k, the rest all of it. Um, so it's worthwhile actually going on to this uh, uh, spreadsheet here, again, thanks to Laura for, for uh, putting it out, because that actually talks about every single scheme which has been given money in London. And uh, in that uh, this is uh, in the middle column, that's the current allocation and the overall allocation on the right hand column. Okay, that's, uh, there is some stuff to read, which I strongly recommend. First of all, here's Transport Action Network. I know I mention them every week. Do try and help with their crowdfunded um, uh, case to stop the road building program uh, based on achieving um, uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in the current local transport today, I very, very, very strongly recommend that you read this article by Professor Phil Goodwin. There's the link. You don't have to have a subscription. You can get in on it. Do read it if you read anything. It tells you everything about transport planning and policy and forecasting and everything where we are now. Uh, it's also an interesting new report for Transport for New Homes. Uh, there's a video on uh, livable streets. Um, uh, nice little video on uh, what to do if you're starting to cycle to work. Uh, there are some webinars run by the Cycling UK. Uh, I think there's one on Thursday on cycling and its role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions with some good speakers. Uh, doing traffic orders in the current conditions. Uh, here's a good official government guidelines at that link. Uh, as a, a new document from the Royal Town Planning uh, Institute. Um, do look at that. And there we have how to get money from temporary cycle schemes from the LCC using the rapid cycleway promotion tool. And you also have uh, an equivalent kind of mugs guide from Cycling UK there at the bottom. Um, I got together a thread from Jack Mazels of some stats from London pre-COVID. Uh, 
So uh, they talk about various, he, he mentions various facts, like if the car owning residents in Camden made their usual public transport trips by car, the number of car trips in the bar by borough residents would almost double. Uh, also, nearly half of Westminster residents who commute by public transport travel less than five kilometres to work, so they could cycle. Um, so, uh, Islington, here's a, a cracker, it has the low, joint lowest share of households without a car at 29%. Uh, however, they've also got the highest number of households without a car, but someone with a driving licence. 26%. So Just a particular to, risk of car ownership increase. So I did a bit uh, of a typo it. on that one. Uh, it Sorry? Was, did a bit of a typo on that one. It should be um, lowest share of households with a car. With a car. I just yep. realised that. I thought I thought there was something wrong there. Tweet <laughs> <Yeah>. in haste. <laughs> uh, speak in haste. Yes, I just noticed it. With a car. Uh, so that's those with a car at 29%. The biggie is that 26% of people who could go back to it. And uh, there you go. Um, I, I thought, I'm not saying, Brian, that some of the presentations got very technical and quite heavy, but I thought I'd do a little bit of light relief with some graphics um, for making the case for sustainable travel. Um, so this is just a quick canter through um, some of the ways in which, sometimes working with Brian, um, we've done graphics where I work, which is great concern. Um, to, uh, to, to promote sustainable travel. And then when Simon kindly uploads this um, later, you'll be able to go back to them and maybe some of them might be useful in everybody's everyday work. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to this group because you've inspired a recent piece of work, um, which is uh, we've had uh, pictures like this presented a few times over the last few weeks. Uh, and then we were given the opportunity to create the Welcome Back to Newcastle City Centre scheme. Um, to try and create something that was more welcoming. And so some of this work that was presented uh, inspired what we've created for Newcastle, which I thought I'd show you, um, which is a, a little messaging system which does, does COVID messaging and wayfinding and a bit of placemaking all at the same time. Um, so this is uh, what's been created. And I'd like to think that um, this group helped inspire it. So this is uh, the sort of place finding bits. And here's the pattern that works and then when it all comes together it's a kind of messaging system for people coming back into Newcastle city centre uh, and this is happening now so these are those kind of messages that we've got live at the moment uh, with some actual commuting messages in there around sustainable travel uh, and this is how it actually plays out on the street so this is what you've inspired and it's live right now in the middle of Newcastle looking like this um, and Brian, especially for you, uh, we've asked them to be, allow us to do a little bit of a cheeky zebra um, using the same pattern. Um, so, so that's what we've been doing in Newcastle. But yeah, I was going to share just some graphic work that we've done um, around uh, uh, particularly case making for sustainable travel. Um, and really, this journey started a long time ago when we did our first cycling campaign with uh, Manchester Friends of the Earth. Uh, which is called Love Your Bike. Uh, and this is an ad we did uh, well over a decade ago with Friends of the Earth in Manchester, um, which got quite, quite good traction. Uh, but since then, we've done loads. So this is an infographic that we did. There was a parliamentary question around the different uh, levels of affordability of different transport modes, and it was shocking. Um, so, we, uh, so we created um, this little infographic around the, the, the sheer huge change in costs of different modes of travel since the 1980s, um, suitably themed around Pac-Man, obviously, to get in with the era. Um, uh, and then since then, we've done quite a few other ones. This is a, a lovely little animated piece that we did for SUSTRANS around the 20th anniversary of the National Cycle Network. So sometimes your infographics need to move. Um, and then you talk about school streets a minute ago. This is... Uh, a way that we brought that to life with Sustrans again a few years ago, where you could cut out and your own active travel spectacles, um, which is a fun way to get kids involved. Uh, another couple of campaigns. This was an interesting one to bring it to life, which was still running in Liverpool city region um, around using real people who walk and cycle to talk about arriving happy at work and their active commutes. And that's gone really well. Um, 
and happy to share a lot of that with anybody who's on the call. Uh, and then we're in our home city of Manchester, uh, we got to do lots of work with TFGM, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, including depicting people in flying saucers uh, and other space age tra travel. So that's quite good fun. Um, but over the years, we collected quite a lot of graphics, which explain some of the key principles, really. Um, this is one that we did for the Cycle City Ambition Grant, uh, Greater Manchester, uh, which had a classic sort of cycle superhighways diagram. Um, but one that I've always really loved, which is that bar chart at the bottom there, which is an old piece of research now, but it talks about different levels of happiness depending on people's commuting mode uh, and how much they liked the ways in which they got to work. Um, and so that was always really good fun, always liked using that one. Um, we have done lots of walking as well though, so here's some recent walking work including walking routes for a project with a great outfit called Bike Right, uh, who are now uh, part of Cycle Confident, um, the Be Confident group uh, in Liverpool called Choose Freedom, uh, and walking in Greater Manchester. So, um, but back to the work we've done and just a series of graphics which help make the case. And so this is the cheeky little bee uh, that we made with Brian to talk about the bee network in Grace Manchester. And for that document, we had this made to move that we got to work with, uh, with Chris and Brian, um, which we tended to use a lot of graphics in there to try and make the case from walking. Um, and here are some of them. And as I say, these will be posted up later, so you, some people might be able to use them. Uh, the one in the middle, for example, I know Chris Paul, who's on the call, loves sharing this on Twitter. Uh, which is importantly not made often enough, which is, um, you know, the cost of doing nothing as a bar chart. But these sort of like cycling graphic, uh, cycling walking sort of case making graphics, including the classic don't waste your road space on cars um, chart, have always gone down really well in, in the pieces of work we've done. Um, but no, I, probably almost nobody's seen this, but the, one of the bits of work that inspired some of those graphics was this, which we did uh, two years before, for the Active Travel Consortium, which was a report that only really went to the DFT. Uh, and here the entire piece was infographics. So the entire report was talking about a lot of the statistics that this group have talked about an awful lot, um, just around the sheer scale of, um, you know, the number of journeys that could be walked or cycled, the proximity that we have to train stations and bus routes, um, the, the sheer number of primary school trips that could be made by alternative modes. Um, and this was a really good journey for us in terms of trying to capture all of this case making, um, including obviously the return on investment. And in the depth of this report, there's quite a lot uh, around other forms of investment. Um, and then what we did was, um, oh, and the other bit that a lot of people on the call will recognize is uh, this had a really useful map of all this sort of decades worth of investment and how it's quite a stop start um, uh, and how we could build on success a little bit more by joining these initiatives up. Um, and then finally on this report, which um, we found really useful a few times, is we depicted a town or cityscape and the different types of interventions that you could make to help active travel to happen. Um, and, and this worked really, really well in terms of sitting down sort of senior politicians in particular, senior advisors, um, and talking them through all the different interventions you can make across an urban landscape to make cycling and walking happen. Uh, and then off the back of that, I just want to finish by saying we picked that up into a much bigger report we just did with uh, lots of infographics for Climate Week in New York, uh, launched in New York, uh, which took that cityscape and recreated it. And I thought I'd share this with everybody because this is about more generally um, uh, the sort of uh, uh, climate change, emerge climate emergency, but again, using that cityscape to to describe what we can do uh, and to get to the end of it what we had was uh, in this report that we did for the coalition for urban transitions was the client on this um, they had some a whole section on the connected city and i'd urge, ev urge everybody um, to go to urbantransitions.global and have a look because um, there's absolutely loads of evidence in this report for why connected cities are critical um, for tackling the climate emergency and loads of stats globally around the damage in particular cars do one of the stats that jumped out for me is the, bar, is the pie chart in the middle there, um, which was when you look at global fossil fuel subsidies, um, the biggest chunk is actually subsidies to fossil fuel based transport, which I hadn't seen isolated as a figure like that before, but it was incredibly powerful. And I just suddenly realized that actually the biggest fossil fuel subsidy in the world 
is actually uh, keeping cars on the road. Um, and then I'll finish on this graphic, which pulled all of that project together. And I just thought it'd be nice uh, for everybody to see the, uh, the connected cities agenda, which includes active transport, um, was one of the lockup elements uh, in this uh, graphic for how we create uh, a net zero city or town of the future. And that, Brian, is me done. All right, so um, this is uh, um, my, my canter through, hopefully, um, from a council view. So I've, I've been a, a cycle campaigner for a very long time and a councillor for six years. Um, I am portfolio holder for BCP, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, a uh, new authority, a year old, 400,000 residents, uh, stretching between Poole Harbour and just beyond Christchurch Harbour. And of course, we have that beach that had 500,000 people on it um, last week. Um, which was a slight problem. So I, I, th I thought it might just be worth just running through this quickly. Obviously, we had a fairly full agenda because we're bringing together three different departments and, uh, um, and, and existing f sources of funding, including we were unfortunate to get um, 79 million out of Transforming Cities Funds. So when COVID hit, we were just about to spend a huge amount of money for us, um, on particularly on, on sustainable transport and, and cycling, cycling routes. But the offices have been pretty good. At, at, um, when pothole funds and, and uh, local enterprise partnership money are trying to make sure, if possible, to squeeze in cycle lanes of some description. I wasn't always pleased with what the, the result, but they were, they were sort of doing the best with what they could. Um, so, uh, um, so that's good. And we're the biggest cycle um, share scheme outside London at the moment. Um, in terms of the Emergency Active Travel Fund, yeah, we got more than 100% of what we, uh, um, what we were allocated. We got 315 of 280,000. Um, and you know the, the criteria for what we're supposed to be picking up. Um, the, the balance is hopefully a million. Um, we think that it'll be netted off, but you know, the 1.3 will be netted off by the, by the um, tranche one. Um, there's also the reopening high street funds. I didn't find out about that immediately, but that sits alongside what we're doing and uh, um, is, is quite uh, um, important to try and link together, not least because sometimes the pedestrian widenings get right in the way of the cycling, as you know. Um, our local cycling walking improvement plan looks like this. Um, it's obviously based on commuting journeys and, um, and, and therefore, um, perhaps it doesn't cover um, quite the leisure routes as I'd like, um, and, uh, um, uh, and the red ones are, are the sustainable routes, that includes bus as well. This is our Transforming Cities Fund routes, um, and, uh, um, and so those are sort of the backbone of where we're trying to go to, and I suppose part of what the, uh, um, the COVID funds allows us to do is to look at the low, low traffic neighbourhoods and fill in a bit. So in terms of our work to date, we actually closed um, all our car parks mid-March, and two of those were relevant to cycling. One was the undercliff between Bournemouth Pier and Boscombe Pier. And I know Mark um, rightly made a good uh, song about uh, um, what happened in Brighton, but we'd actually um, created a new cycleway uh, almost by default along, the, uh, along that route, because you could cycle it before, but they didn't have all the cars in the way. Um, I've managed to, to stop them from reopening that car park, so it continues to be a good route, although um, we're now into the season when you can't cycle along the seafront uh, generally. Uh, um, in, in Bournemouth and Paul in July and August. At the bottom of the pitch there is, is Tupton Bridge between Bournemouth and Christchurch. It's a dreadful bridge um, for all modes actually. And it's very narrow for pedestrians. Uh, we've made that one way for pedestrians. Uh, the bikes really don't have anywhere to go. Some of them cycle on the pavement. I get regular correspondence from someone who hates that and would like to see the bike swimming. Um, in fact, one time I think he tried to do that. Um, We've also looked at some pavement widening and we paid for those out of the transport fund, although actually I found out later about this, this sort of rejuvenating high street fund. In terms of our tranche one list, I think um, that one of the reasons why everyone's struggling to get hold of the list is because um, it, it, because of the speed, we're having to be a bit careful about uh, boxing and coxing and changing uh, based on, on deliverability. So the list as we submitted has changed slightly since we submitted it. Um, I'll come back to Pool High Street in some detail because that's just gone live and that's, uh, that's uh, um, very active for me. Um, but some of the ones at the bottom, the three at the very bottom, uh, were quite easy. They're, they're about uh, um, extending bus stop space at, at the main terminuses. So Paul, Paul Bus Station, Jarvis Place in the middle of Bournemouth. Uh, move, we had to move a taxi rank for that, so I had some more rate taxi drivers. Um, and the Swanage Ferry, which stopped, and then when they restarted, said, we're not taking uh, people on foot and with bikes. So we had to provide queuing space for them, and then they, they accepted that they'd take them. Um, many of those we're trying to move forward, but they're not fully designed, they're not consulted yet. Um, but the big one for me is, is this one, which is Pool High Street and, and Pool Quay, um, which is a really narrow street. It's a very historic street um, and, and was very much uh, um, at the top of our list of, of schemes that we wanted to achieve. We did have, uh, we've got to about a thousand schemes, I think, that across the, the or a thousand ideas across the, the area that we would like to, to move forward with. Um, this has uh, landed a bit like a lead balloon for the businesses in, in the area because, uh, um, because we didn't, we used the, um, the uh, uh, experimental um, TRO and, and therefore with seven days notice and they, they didn't know it was coming. So uh, there was a real uh, um, problem with that. 
Um, this is the street on Saturday morning when we closed the road, um, and uh, um, you can see the, the comments from the, some of the businesses on the right hand side. Um, but some of the people who were very positive actually said, but it's horrible. Um, we wanted uh, something that's really welcoming, and that just kind of suggests to people that it shouldn't be there. Um, this was it this morning. We've managed to get to source some planters and try and improve that a bit. Um, but I guess you know that's 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 what we were dealing with before. So so it had parking on one side, it had a, a line of cars, um, and and everyone was squeezed onto the pavement. So obviously pre-COVID, it kind of it was pretty horrible, but worked. Um, and you can see why we why we've done it. This was it on Saturday, um, and uh, um, much better. We didn't have the sunshine, sadly. Some of the businesses have, have made most of it and really liked it. Um, many of them are actually struggling and, and still very cross and, uh, um, and upset and feeling that they're losing, losing money. This is the key. Um, one young cyclist in the middle there, which uh, was really pleasing to see. Uh, um, but again, the numbers seem to be down. We've not had the best weekend to go live with it. Um, back at the beginning of May, I was trying to say, well, how do we get our, um, our cycle our, our, uh, activists involved? The H Active Travel is, is, is a group that we, we work closely with. Um, but also members of the public. And we use Widen My Path because we're in the middle of um, trying to procure um, consultation software. So we didn't think we'd use the other free offer. Um, that's it now. Uh, as I say, we've got about a thousand ideas across the area that we, we people like to do. Um, so we're, we're, um, these are really the challenges that we have. Um, the urgent times is getting work done at pace when we were already doing an awful lot. Um, I think the consulting articles on the ETROs, I'd really warn against doing that. You know, there's something about trying to get uh, um, some informal consultation. And I've been quite frustrated because I've been I was trying to do that beforehand and um, spent most of the weekend on the high street trying to talk to the businesses about um, how it wasn't the end of the world. Um, coordination with the reopening the high street fund, as I mentioned, um, from a standing start and on top of existing work, um, uh, the officers do feel, I think, run, run a bit ragged. Um, we're not at all short of ideas, um, but we are, um, we are, you know, the, the, the activists are all saying, but the, the traffic is back to normal levels and we haven't really started. And we are seeing um, a degree of bike clash because almost as soon as we um, closed the key to traffic, people were saying, well, we don't want bikes here either. Um, and I think that was partly in response to the fact that they, they thought that might, uh, might be directly aimed at, at, at us. Um, obviously, we've got to um, look at progress by the end of August and we've only just had the money literally Friday of last week, um, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and um, I hope our ambition is really reasonably high. We've certainly got plenty of things to choose from. That was me. So to those who don't know me, I'm, I'm an operational road safety um, engineer. Operational safety is uh, not construction safety. It's um, road worker and road user safety um, while roads are uh, in their operational maintenance states. Um, so my interest is uh, across the big picture of safety, and I'll explain what that is, or the, the pu public good in the wider sense. Um, so I'm slightly come at it from a slightly strange background. I'm a chartered civil engineer, I'm a fellow of the Society of Road Safety Auditors, and I have a degree in psychology. And I think I'm the only person who's got all this three. Um, so I do maybe come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so just to clarify, micromobility collectively is the generic term for a whole range of different things. Um, I think these are probably the four categories. The, the e unicycle segways now gone, hoverboards, e scooters. Um, but I think e scooters, the thing in the middle, um, uh, and I provocatively included somebody with a, with a helmet, and um, it is quite an interesting um, subject, very different to cycling uh, in terms of uh, head protection for reasons I'll explain. Um, but I think really we're talking about e scooters realistically in terms of what's coming with the trial and what the safety impact is and the global scale of these sort of um, vehicles. So I start from the position of how should we think about risk if we're doing something new? And it's useful to look at a range of things we did in the past and what we learned from them. Um, and some of the really big iconic things that have been done in the last 10 to 15 years, um, shed space, whatever we like the term of that, modern urban design, removal of street lighting, removing the pedestrian guardrail, um, smart motorway, removal of hard shoulder, part-time, full-time. We've done these things which were expected to make things worse and they made things better for, for safety as well as capacity or other reasons. Um, they worked for reasons we didn't understand until we did them. Um, and I think we need to be quite open to the fact you might get benefits you didn't expect and you might get mm. drawbacks. So my start point is you need to balance risk and that's um, road risk, injury risk, against the other effects, mortality, morbidity, emissions, other environmental impact, and so on. Um, and the sort of, you know, what benefit you can get collectively. Um, 
I'm, I'm not a fan of people who say it's just about safety. If safety is worse, we wouldn't do it. On that basis, we wouldn't let people cycle rather than drive because the injury risk per mile is higher. But it's a, it's a fatuous argument, really. It should be about the bigger picture. Um, I thought it's worth asking ourselves, where are we on micromobility on the um, um, sort of Gartner curve of you start out from sort of innovation, left field things, then you get these inflated expectations where things like mobility as a service um, kind of sits at the minute. Then things sort of decline in expectations. Um, so this is expectations on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Um, we're probably talking micro mobility is probably sort of on the peak of this, of inflated expectations, good and bad. Um, uh, more adaptable multimodal travel as a good um, potential complexity and road safety impacts uh, both for users and for pedestrians as an adverse. Um, the impact of that is as they roll out, you then get lower expectations into this sort of trough of disillusionment. Um, and sometimes perception of things isn't, is, is at odds with um, the reality. And we need to keep asking ourselves what, it, what is it we're trying to achieve. So I think it's also worth asking yourself, does legal matter, does compliant matter? This is a graphic I produced when we were talking about cycle superhighways and kind of modern um, and ancient approaches to cycling. And I think it's useful to think about things in a context of, does it comply with standards? You know, for an e-scooter, that might be its manufacturing standards. Uh, is it compliant with the current law? And is it safe? And sometimes if the question is, it's safe and look unlawful, we need to change the standards. Or if it's compliant and safe, we need to change the laws. And I think we need to be quite sort of provocative sometimes about um, uh, seeing things in a bigger framework and change, changing something bigger than we thought we could. Um, the danger is you don't get um, the public health benefits if you're not open to, to those, that sort of bigger picture. So what does good look like for me for micromobility? There's sort of four bits of a Venn diagram. Uh, top left, capital and revenue cost. That's both capital and revenue of infrastructure cost and of buying the thing itself. I'm going to go through each of these uh, briefly in a moment. Um, top right is the capital and revenue environmental impact. So that's um, the carbon and environmental impact of the things we build. So the, the making the scooter and any infrastructure we might put in for it um, uh, and of its use. Um, so that's looking at things like, do they reduce emissions? It depends on what they're replacing. If it's replacing a pedestrian, no, it's not reducing emissions. If it's replacing a car driver, yes, it is. Um, and not making assumptions about what they replace, uh, actually going and finding out. Bottom left is the big picture of health, mortality and morbidity from road risk and active travel. One of my favorite technical papers, I don't know if anyone's seen the Barcelona technical paper. Barcelona looks quite like Oxford Street, central London. Um, and they looked at the mortality, morbidity benefits of cycling. Um, air quality and road risk um, uh, balanced against uh, the, the physical health benefits and the benefits were 73 times better than the adverse effects you know in qualities you know quality adjusted like years um, and so when people say you know a cyclist might might be killed it's pointing at that bigger picture and I think too often we don't do the bigger picture we need to ask this question of um, micro mobility particularly e-scooters and then the bottom right is the kind of operational functionality about how reliable are journeys. Um, if if, a, if a, an e-scooter means people get a more reliable journey, they might be willing to do an e-scooter journey rather than a car journey. And that would be a good thing. Um, uh, whereas if it's replacing a cycling journey, then there probably isn't a journey reliability benefit. Um, uh, road space benefit, how many people can you physically fit in a space? the kind of modal interchange efficiency and all of these four components have beneficial aspects and adverse aspects. It's too easy to think it's a benefit in one aspect and a negative in the other. They are complex um, and we need to stare hard at all the positive and adverse impacts before we take a decision. So quickly running through, oh, but, um, one of my favourite ever graphics is if you Google Guardian or Causes of Death 2010, you'll probably find this image. Um, it sort of captures for me the big picture of what we're trying to achieve. So this is a graphic that shows in the middle all causes of death in 2010. Numbers haven't changed very much. Roughly half a million people die in the UK every year. Um, when people tell you cycling is dangerous, this red hand top right is all accidental death. That accuses everything from 
um, hanging, self-harm, falling from height, um, uh, crush injuries, uh, and the tiny little um, hand that points down from that, that red bigger hand is transport and a teeny tiny little sub-element in that particular year, 96 cycle. This is the kind of thing I show people when I'm trying to get them to think about pros and cons of interventions, not to see it in a simplistic sort of four legs good, two legs bad kind of way. So quickly just taking the four different components um, as, a, as a, a, a risk assessor, uh, taking all of these four elements together, capital and revenue is relatively straightforward. Probably we're not talking about new infrastructure, we're talking about people using existing infrastructure might be charging infrastructure um, to pay for, but probably not much. Um, and they're relatively cheap to buy, you know, compared to uh, other modes, uh, both fares and um, uh, purchase of a vehicle. But note that they're toys at the minute. In law, they're toys. Uh, that's the manufacturer standards they're made to. They're made to be used a few times and thrown away in quality terms. So uh, if we're regulating for quality, that will increase cost. Um, so we need to bear that in mind. Second bit of the jigsaw is the environmental impact. So the capital environmental impact, don't need to build any infrastructure probably. Um, vehicle uh, capital impact, um, if they've got a short life, you can't repair them. They've got an integral battery you can't replace, can't repair the tires. They're made to a low standard. That's not a very sustainable thing as a vehicle. Um, the revenue environmental impact, charging is um, obviously while uh, a lot of power is uh, fossil fuel based. Their environmental impact is uh, negative from a climate change perspective. Um, uh, so that's worse than cycling and walking. Um, E-bike may be comparable, but we're probably talking about slightly different um, uh, aspirations for journey sets. Um, they're better than being in a car and a taxi as a single um, person in a car or taxi, uh, but they're worse than being a pedestrian. So. It comes back to the net effect on environmental impact for me as part of that big picture is given that importantly uh, studies in, in Denmark, which is quite a good indication, they found that only 8% of users were transferring from cars. The rest were walking, cycling or using public transport. So from an environmental point of view, the benefit is pretty minimal. I'm not saying it's not there at all, but it's, it's pretty low uh, and it's often argued to be bigger. We don't know whether it will be the same in the UK, but I think that's a good start point, you know, looking at what other countries have found. Third bit of the jigsaw is the operational. Journey reliability um, uh, should be convenient, uh, but if you can park them, they're quite heavy um, and, and getting heavier. Uh, so um, a sort of convenience in terms of um, uh, um, reliability of a journey is probably a slightly mixed picture. Um, they're made as toys, as I say, and therefore the whole reliability and sort of um, durability of the vehicle is 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 questionable in some respects um so um that bit of sort of operational sense is um probably ne negative for me road space they take up a bit less space space in a bicycle it's probably not that much in it um the fact that they're not so stable means potentially you need more space around them than you do with a bicycle um and i'll come to that why in a moment um uh and they take up more space than a pedestrian. Again, for the same reason, they're getting bigger. Uh, they're currently 250 watt, and there's a the DFT consultation asked about making them 350 watt. That's a bigger, heavier vehicle, takes up more space, um, um, but still with the vulnerability of um, something that moves at high speed with very teeny wheels. Uh, last bit of the operational side is the kind of modal interchange, the efficiency of transport, and that's what these are often cited at. How efficiently can you move humans around the place? Um, it's probably more efficient than trying to park a car and then get on a train, just pick up your scooter when you get outside the station, you probably scoot close to the door. Um, albeit you've now got something to trip over when you, you're you know, put, taking it over footbridges and getting in and out of lifts and things. Um, less efficient than walking um, and the whole kind of lid back, back, bashing effect. Uh, and then the last bit of the, the Venn diagram is the health mor mortality and morbidity. And I've left it to last deliberately because if you've got bigger benefits in other contexts, it puts this in context. Um, so you don't do something, you don't not do something um, because it might have, a, have adverse effects, but it's um, making sure you've looked at all the different components. So taking the active travel element first, 
as I say, 92% of users um, in the continental countries that PACS looked at uh, are walking and cycling uh, converts, so that's not a benefit in active travel. Only 8% are transferring from car use or taxi use, um, so that's a pretty modest benefit. Uh, then looking at injury risk, um, we've got small wheels, uh, easier to lose control on a surface defect. Denmark found that uh, e-scooter users had eight times the head injury rate per mile travelled of cyclists. That's a big deal and it's quite a big data set. Denmark's got a lot of them. So um, that's not to say it'd be the same everywhere, but it's a good pointer and it follows first principles. These are quite fast moving vehicles and these, they're only 250 watt a minute as I understand it in Denmark. Uh, DFT is looking at making 350 watt going even faster here. Um, they're vulnerable because they have little wheels, they lose control, you go with the handlebars and most injury is hitting a motor, motor vehicle. That's most e-scooter injury isn't bashing your head on the curb, it's being hit by an adjacent car. Um, and then there are the obstruction issue for pedestrians. So we all see the dockless bikes in London littering the footways. Um, they're mostly bright green and bright orange. So if you are sighted, you can at least see them. Um, but these things are everywhere. And if you go and look at the places where they put them in, a lot of cities are now starting to regulate them because they're just finding they're abandoned everywhere. People just drop them where they go. Um, so on balance for me, they're only beneficial if you get a modal shift from car use and it looks like you don't. Um, it's not so, that wouldn't be the case here, but that's kind of where it looks for me. So just looking at different sort of three examples of street scenes to finish. Um, here's an example of segregated facilities. Um, where would they be here? They'd be in the cycle facilities. Um, in that situation, they're taking up space you could fit a cyclist in. My personal view is I'd rather see someone on a bicycle and someone on an e-scooter because the active travel benefit. Um, then where you've got uh, no cycle facilities at all, um, the, um, you end up with something that looks a bit like a pedestrian with hand luggage rather than like a bicycle. So it's sort of interesting question of do motor vehicle drivers perceive their uh, movement and behaviour? They're going to be going on and off of footways, um, uh, making more complex movements than Bicycles do probably more of the time. So the scope for conflict um, and potential harm from motor vehicle conflict for me is quite high in, in these kinds of networks. But if they're allowed, they'll be allowed everywhere on you know, places like this. And then the third category is where we've got more of a kind of suburban type facility, this Hills Road in Cambridge, um, where uh, there aren't many cyclists shown here, but there's actually a lot in practice. Um, and um, in this kind of location, you probably won't have a problem, problem because while it's heavily used, there's enough space for people to pass each other. It's not like central London routes where you get massive volumes of people. But you may find over time as volumes increase that you start to get conflict between cycles and um, e-scooters. And cycles typically uh, are only travelling at a relatively low speed. I think it was 10, 10 and a half miles an hour um, typical speed. E-scooters are probably going to be going faster. If they're 350 watt, not 250 watt, they'd definitely be going faster unless the speed regulated. So I think that's a, a factor we should consider. So um, just sort of closing thoughts of what we should be looking at. Uh, I'm a big fan of monitoring. I think we should be asking what, what did we think would happen? And then when we've done it, what actually happened? Are we different to continental countries or are we not? Um, and ask ourselves the actual reality. Same with public health, what, um, uh, what modal shift are we getting in there for what public, um, what active health benefit from that? Um, should we see these micromobilities types collectively or separately? Do we let e-scooters and everyone else use the same facilities or do we say just an e-scooter and their vehicle categorised and regulated in that way? Um, should the fact that people do illegal things, like riding them on the footway, affect our legislation for them doing illegal things, like riding on the road? I'm not saying yes or no, I'm saying we, we need to ask ourselves a question. Um, I would suggest that micromobility collisions should be recorded separately. At the moment, if you are using a push scooter, you're just a pedestrian and um, you can uh, search for them in databases, not very easily, 
but I do think we should be identifying these separately so we can be monitoring their safety and their effectiveness. Um, my conclusion personally, and it is my personal view, it's not the version of the view officially the company I work for, but I'm, I believe in a single version of the truth. It's complicated and we need to keep asking ourselves what the net benefit is. For me, it's this public health active travel benefit big enough to justify what look like significant safety uh, effects. And I think it might be like tobacco. We can't put it back in genie packet in the jar. So if we can't uninvent something, we need to work out how to manage it safely. That's probably about regulation, but it's a um, tricky balance really. That's me. Well done. Thank you. Great. So this is a presentation, just a little one of um, some research that we did. I'm, I'm a trustee of the London Cycling Campaign and me and Megan wrote this report as part of the policy forum. Um, it was a bit of research that started back last summer and um, we kind of wrote the actual report in um, January, February and then it actually got published um, earlier this month I think so j that's just a bit of context. Um, really what motivated it was um, the Department for Transport was making some noises about micro mobility and um, we thought we should probably get out ahead and do a, make a discussion paper about what maybe a few issues that the cycling community could consider when we're trying to make up our minds about um, e-scooters and other types of micro mobility. So um, chapters one and two um, of the report are kind of setting out the definition and framing. So we've used uh, the a kind of framework of mass and speed, which groups similar um, sized vehicles together, um, which we think is how the roads should be organized. So that's why we've kind of done that. Um, it puts more vulnerable users together and um, larger ones like buses and cars obviously separately, which is how cycling campaigners normally think about the road anyway. Um, so we've just got a couple um, characteristics here, um, small active e-assist, and we've also got quite a broad definition of micromobility, which we've taken from the International Transport Forum's um, paper, um, which includes basically all small light forms of um, personal transport. We also had uh, quite a lot of conversation about the freight transport bit, which um, the previous speaker didn't mention, but I, we really think it's one of the areas with the most potential and in terms of result and modal share, e-scooters are not going to be huge. They're obviously not going to be larger than a cycle modal share, whereas freight might actually be a considerable addition to our cities in the coming years. So um, we've got a little bit about that in the report. Um, next chapter, we spoke a bit about decarbonisation and mode shift, which are really linked and they're both really difficult. Um, I think that there are definitely some problems with our mode shift data. Um, although it's a, it's kind of an aggregate of like a lot of different cities, a lot of them in America. So obviously they start with a higher car modal share, um, which you could argue explains why there is such a high shift from private vehicles that doesn't translate to Europe. Um, and then in terms of the decarbonisation modal shift obviously has a big impact on that. Um, so in terms of the city, how many people are actually switching from car and how many are switching from walking, which is a lower carbon mode. And in addition, um, are these e-scooters or whatever kind of micro mobility you're using, are they personal or rental? Because those two also have a massive difference between them in terms of decarbonisation. Um, because of the juicing and rebalancing of the rental mode, so the people driving around in vans, um, moving the, the vehicles around, um, only happens in a rental model, and that's where the majority of the carbon emissions will come from. Um, and the final point in this chapter is that e-scooter riders don't like riding on the pavements. There's actually a lot of data on this in comparison to the other two areas. And there's a really clear view here that um, they think it's really annoying to ride on the pavements as you know, we would understand as cyclists. So um, yeah, that's, that's not surprising there. Um, 
we have a section on uh, adapted cycles, um, e-bikes and freight. Um, and we had, yeah, a lot of discussions about this because it was, I think it's really difficult to find a balance between larger vehicles and but then being able to use the cycle infrastructure we already have, but at the same time not pushing the more vulnerable users out of, for instance, the cycle superhighway. Um, I think it, in this picture of this UPS, it's really interesting. I think he's cycling. Um, I think that's what he's doing with his legs there. So it, it's probably e-assist, but it's huge, right? That's almost the size of a car. Um, so that's kind of why we started referring to these um, international transport transport forum types um, just as a kind of framework um, I think they are really useful and in terms of where these go on the road which I'll talk about in, in a bit later um, I think it's also it's nice to kind of draw some boundaries because this is a continuum whereas these are a bit segregated um, um, the next section was about regulation, which I think is the most interesting chapter writing for me. Um, we thought that it should happen at local authority level, which I think is going to happen. Um, and we just kind of discussed some things that maybe local authorities would want to consider, cycle campaign groups would want to ask their local authorities for. Um, so maybe accreditation. We're really lucky to have uh, Como UK in this country um, who are really on it. Um, the design of the object. Now, our thesis is that having a different shaped object might encourage a different constituency of um, people to cycling or cycling adjacent activities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Maybe you're a bit nervous about the balancing or something like that, but the seat might encourage people, especially if it's a rental scheme. So that's our thesis and obviously up for discussion. Um, and the design of the scheme. Um, in the area of the city, which I think is probably the most crucial. I'm hoping that it, since it's a kind of new, refreshing mode, maybe the schemes might be a bit more spread out and kind of fill gaps in, in transport networks that currently don't have anything. I, I don't know, like, um, like a town and their route to their nearest station. Um, obviously, a lot of people will be using that to commute is there a better way that they could do that than driving to the station even you know it might be a mile a mile and a half and that just it just seems silly um so maybe e-scooter rental schemes would be able to fill that gap in the way that for some for whatever reason cycling schemes have been unable to do so far um access we talked a little bit about how to access rental schemes without a smartphone um a problem which has already been solved by cycle schemes in a lot of um, european countries but we noted that Santander cycles doesn't really meet a lot of those criteria. Um, so that's just something to consider. And um, I also wanted to mention real quick, um, good jobs. I think there's a legitimate opposition to e-scooters that would be uh, the jobs that the rental schemes create are very poor conditions, um, zero hours contracts. There's no job security often, poverty pay. Um, and the rental schemes, carbon emissions, if you're using your own van to drive around, then they'll obviously be higher. Um, so maybe uh, some certain campaign groups might want to campaign to try and avoid those jobs being created or improve them. Um, and then I suppose the mobility as a service potential, there's definitely mobility, like ability for um, greater trip linking, um, though it's a shame that we can't conceive of them, uh, trips being linked with, with cycles. Um, and then the next, the final chapter that we, we just kind of played around a bit with um, some alternative street design layouts. This picture is from um, the low traffic neighbourhood super block in Barcelona. Um, and it's, we kind of tried to resolve the earlier problem of balancing different uh, sizes of vehicle, different speeds of vehicle. So we thought maybe uh, on some main roads you could have one lane for cycles one lane for faster freight, maybe up to mopeds, which obviously need a license and helmet. And then maybe another one for buses and taxis. We've already got a couple of bus and bike only streets in London. Um, so just being a bit creative with that, I think. Um, it doesn't just have to be, are they on the cycle lane or are they on the pavement? It can be, um, we can be a bit creative. 
and uh, we also spoke a bit about parking here. Um, there's some really cool parking out there. Um, I know you already spoke about cycle parking earlier um, in the maybe last week's session, I think, Brian. But um, yeah, there's some really cool products, actually, I think. And then um, obviously, since we wrote this, there's been a lot that's happened. Um, there's a the call for evidence out on the Department for Transport trials um, in several areas of the country. I think London Cycling Campaign was requesting that the boroughs were, ne were next to each other in London so that you can actually have a decent length of trip. Um, but we'll see what happens there. And it kind of gives us an idea of the direction of travel. So they're saying they want to regulate them like EAPCs, no helmets, 12.5 miles an hour, which is really interesting. Um, but for the moment, you've got to have a driving license. And um, I've run out of time for my COVID point. Um, but thank you very much. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah, cheers, Pearl. Um, yeah, I've got plenty to say on this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save my talk till for next Thursday. Landor doing a conference on it, and I'm a, a part of that. Um, but um, yeah, Lorna, did you want to make any observations before we kind of throw it up for a little bit of a conversation? Um, I don't think I have masses to add. I think Kate's presentation was a very helpful summary. My note was that that success criteria of it's only a success if it's modal shift from cars, I think potentially might have been true four months ago. I think we are now in a COVID-19 world where perhaps modal shift from public transport could be uh, a legitimate success criteria. The really interesting paper that the ITF, she's Anne De something, she's the ITF Young Researcher of the Year, did a really nice life cycle analysis of carbon emissions from e-scooters concluded that in Paris they had added 12,000 tonnes of carbon emissions but that there were a lot of tweaks that you could make to the operating system that might bring them down into a net carbon benefit even with a relatively small modal shift from cars. Um, I don't know if people have seen the BBC article which I will put in the chat in a second that apparently e-scooters are coming to Middlesbrough next week so <laughs> all the chat saying they're coming and we can't Thank stop you. them might potentially be correct um I will float around um I've got a pub quiz at half six but I can give you another 10 minutes if people want to bash things yeah. into the questions yeah I think we'll probably be done in in 10 minutes uh well it's just an interesting one about during the covid uh, which has really been one of the focus on now is what all those Islington people who can afford cars, do we want them buying cars now while they can't get a bus or would we rather put an e-scooter in their hand, you know, or prefer preferably a bike. And, and just on the decarbonisation point, I happen to know these figures off the top of my head, uh, that they're from various sources, like a, a car's about 261 grams of CO2 per kilometre, a bike's about 21 grams. And so far, although they're getting better, e-scooters are, and reported about 126 so it's a uh, it's practically half of a car because they only get a few months out of them 18 months top so uh, worth bearing that in mind as well but uh, i'll be making i'm not case. i'm not really on board with this yep. life cycle point i feel like it's not a fair test because we don't make the same comparison about uh motor cars or even electric cars it, buying a new part for, for for a normal car that's just seen as maintenance Whereas getting a new battery for an e-scooter, people saying it's undermining the the whole mode. Um, I don't really feel like, I feel like it's a dead end, really. Well, yeah, but you can get them where they swap, but at the moment they're just chucking the whole thing away, toy-like, like Kate was saying, and then putting a new one on the ground and going, oh, actually, it's more about the rental costs in there. So we What's get really interesting is um, yeah. some of the uh, rental companies are actually asking for longer contracts because they're saying, um, if, my, if our contract with the local authority is a year, we've got to throw away all our hardware, find something to do with it. Um, but a longer contract could encourage e-scooter companies to not be so wasteful with their, um, yeah. with their product release. Well, that's it. And you start regulating, you start doing it. Okay, we, we've got plenty of hands up. So uh, Mark, Mark, I can see your hand up and then and I'll go to Claire and when anybody else, we might have to just bully your way in. I mean, I just I was part of the PAX discussion back in December or November, whenever it was, and 
essentially said everything that Kate has been saying, and I completely agree. Sorry, Pearl, but but I think we're in exactly the same position now as we were with Oculus e-bikes. It's 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 a capitalist company trying to pinch a bit of the territory. Um, the genie's out of the bottle, though, and people are using it. And Brian's maybe right about um, it's better they use a scooter than a car. But there's absolutely no evidence from anywhere apart from the states, as Kate said, about modal shift. And we're just cannibalizing. We're really ca shooting ourselves in the foot and cannibalizing bike use. But on the other hand, we can't come over all um, dictatorial and say you mustn't do that because that, that would actually scare more people off. So it's a really difficult balance to take. But I, you know, I think the only the only thing in favor of them is that we can't be seen to oppose them. But there's no positive things for, for supporting them. So we should just essentially let them happen and manage it. But Mark, are we more it, like America? Yeah, go on, Paul. Even in European cities, modal shift from bikes to e-scooters never exceeds 10%. And it's normally around four or five. So I don't really see how allowing more people to use our infrastructure could be anything other than increasing demand and, and letting other people know how great it is to be outdoors and decide your own route and all the similarities that there are with cycling. But, but, it, but, but it's a dead end. They'll, they, they don't, there's no evidence they'll shift from there. All the stuff about, oh, it's a gateway to cycling, it isn't. They'll, they'll shift from, maybe they'll shift from, essentially it's walking that people are shifting from. So we're taking, don't think there's, no, there's no health benefits. Yeah. There's no active travel benefits. Well, this, this is can this I, is Megan. If I can, if I can add um, yeah. two points. One regarding the active travel benefits, there is not a single study, and I reviewed over two hundred that has looked at the Mets or physical activity benefits. Yes, it is most certainly worse than walking. How much better is it than a car? We don't know. So mm. somewhere in between. Obviously, the scale is going to be further away from walking. So to say there's no active travel benefits is not entirely true. Okay. I'll, the I'll second take. the second point of this is one of the views we took in the micromobility report was looking more holistically at how can we shift away from car-free cities. I mean, if you look at some of the what these public e-scooter companies are looking at, we are really talking about a very small percentage of mode share. So when we looked at this, it wasn't, are they going to replace cycling? How ubiquitous are they going to be? We sort of looked at that, but the reality is, at best, like some of their dream scenarios is that they'd get to 2% mode share for the entire city. So, I mean, like a very small slice. And one of the other things is how, if we're going smaller and we want to go smaller and we want cycling, whether it's adaptable, two wheels, cycle freight to be ubiquitous we need more infrastructure that promotes smaller micro mobilities um, and then the last point i would say about the injury rate um, when you look at the when when i look at the injury rate studies there's a, str a strong number of them happen to be young and drunk um, mm. and unfortunately you know there's also another percentage of those people who all they do is walk or drive a car if they got into a bicycle without learning how to ride the bike, they'd have similar injuries as well. They are inherently more stable bicycles. Scooters, small wheels, small surface differences will tip someone over and they're into a vehicle. It is inherently a, a more unstable vehicle and no. more power. Absolutely. Can I, hey, uh, can I, can make I have a... Can I'm I just going to let Claire come in first. I'll have to be a bit of a chair now. Claire first and then Bob, and then we'll go back to the experts on it. Uh, yeah. Claire? I, I just wanted to make a point about what I see as the bigger picture, which is I, I think that, um, you know, what we should really be talking about is there's going to be massive growth in wheeled mobility aids. Okay, aging population. You see, it's worth having a talk on this on this on this session at some point. And I think therefore needing to move to streets where. We're catering for different types of non-motor vehicle mobility is important. But the fact that, that if we're going to let that debate be led by e-scooters, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot exactly. because it's going to be perceived as another, oh, just some, you know, uh, kind of privileged elites who can dick about on an e-scooter who want their share of the street this has got to be about inclusive street design for people uh, who don't use cars and it's got to start with people on mobility scooters and if these e-scooters e benefit fair enough but 
otherwise it's it's not helpful good point bob bob i'm sure that set you up nicely oh yeah i mean i'm i really want to rant here because uh i mean the best that can be said is that they might not be dreadful and i mean how we've got into a position where cycling people you know we've got so many problems just getting cycling going uh, how we've got in a position we're doing all this research and this sort of trendiness of micro mobility and throwing it in with uh, cargo bikes which they're quite different from um, you know uh, it, it let me just quickly go through I mean Kate gave a very balanced approach and actually I don't think we should be balanced I think we should be saying no so let me just say i think they compete with bicycles no evidence that people say oh they're good let's ride a bicycle come on um they're not active travel and uh, i have to say that i've had problems with them coming much too close to me now when i mentioned this a couple of weeks ago someone said oh yeah but people say that about cyclists you know we mustn't be bad to these people actually i think we could do cycling and walking a lot big favor by getting in here and saying, no, we don't like these things. These are for hipsters, they're trendy, they're not liked by most members of the population. And when Mark says we mustn't be seen to be against them, why? Why do we have to be seen to be not against them? You know, why do we have to be going out of our way for these big capitalist companies that just want to make a quick buck and it isn't going to be a big benefit. You know, people like Shane saying, um, you up, know, some, some of them might be uh, kind of, um, you know, putting pressure on getting better, um, you know, surfaces, therefore it will help. No, they're not. They're not gonna be pushing as an overall uh, part of being on our side. Um, uh, just a quick, thing which hasn't been talked about sorry I went offline for a bit um, I it may have been mentioned but this thing about head injuries and helmets if we get big pushes for helmets for uh, e-scooter users then that reopens the whole thing about pushing for helmets for cyclists we really do not need that uh, so you know uh, there's there's lots of stuff and then there's the problems with the dockless ones and the attitude you know mark and others are sort of well yeah you know we may have to have them so let's just try and regulate them i think we can put a no to them and stuff like you know going from 250 watts to 350 that is really serious if you you know anything about what usage yes. from strava and all the stuff on gps systems for bikes which is that's why we set powerful. different types yeah, of bikes. Like, come so back now. i just finish yeah, come on wrap it up robert uh so that is the, the basic thing and you know i think we shouldn't be for them and we should just push for walking and cycling they will have their own advocates we don't need to spend time on pushing them yeah, pearl go for it I just want to say that we did set the different types apart and we proposed different types of infrastructure for them. We're not saying 350 mopeds in the cycle lanes. Yes, come on. Like it, it wasn't that kind of thing. We had 150 source documents. It's like a, a proper researched long report. Mm. Um, we're, not, we're not just kind of gung ho for e-scooters. It's just a kind of, this is what we learned. Um, and I'm really happy that we're having this, this discussion. Um, but I really don't think that they're as, as fearful as everyone is making them out to be. Lorna or Megan, do you want to come in? I'm going to let Ruth in a minute to ask a different question. I just uh, want to give everybody a chance. Uh, yeah, you're happy with that. Uh... So if I might just add, I mean, with this report, we wanted to see basically with LCC, should we be actively campaigning against them? And the verdict was we should not be actively campaigning against them but we aren't going to necessarily be actively campaigning for them. Um, LCC is about cycling um, and that's what we're campaigning for. So we're obviously not going out and, and campaigning for e-scooters or trying to get into a new campaigning mode, but we're also not going to go out and actively campaign against them. I would say the area 
um, we're really keen on is the trials, understanding parking, which, you know, we are a huge proponent that pavement should be for pedestrians. So one of the things that we'll be looking at over the next few months really closely are these trials, understanding the parking and looking to our members to understand more detailed interactions of e-scooters, which haven't been made available in any of the studies that we evaluated.